the art was priceless. The theft was simple. A two-bit crook may hold the key, but the greatest art heist in history may never be solved. St. Patrick's Day weekend, 1990. In a city like Boston, the holiday provides every excuse for a proper binge. At 1 a.m. on Sunday, many were still partying. Others had jobs to do. Inside the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, two art students, moonlighting as security guards for 6.85 an hour, had the place to themselves. The safety of 2,500 world masterpieces was in their hands. And on this night, March 18th, some of those treasures would slip through their fingers. Though the Gardner Museum had been retrofitted with video surveillance, an alarm system, and infrared sensors, the building wasn't designed with security in mind. The thing that struck me the most about it was that it was uh, inherently a very difficult place to secure. It's a, um, a mansion. It, it was built well over 100 years ago. Even so, no one had ever tried to break in or steal any of the gardener's treasures. The guards had no reason to believe tonight would be any different. This was just another night of easy work. One man watched the monitors, ready to press the panic button at the first hint of trouble. The other patrolled the floor and reported back. It was a simple, effective routine. But the men who came to rob the gardener had an effective routine of their own. Open the door, Boston PD! The guard, surprised at the pounding, was doubly surprised to see it was the police. Bob, can I get you to come on down here? 10 4, copy that. Something kind of odd going on. Roger, I'll be right there. I'm on my way. The officer told the bewildered guard that someone from the museum had reported a disturbance. I didn't report any disturbance here. The guard tried to convince the officers that everything was in order. The police insisted on checking out the museum themselves. The criminal plan of the thieves using the two bogus police officers to enter the Gardner Museum was quite simple and quite easily executed. The Gardner Museum could have been as secure as Fort Knox, but that does no good if the guard's going to let the thief in. Even the most finely tuned security system can be undone by the simplest human miscalculation. Once the entrance was breached, the chain of events was set into motion. The officers deftly caught the men off guard by demanding to see their identification. You're not the disturbance. Why are you somebody, right, now, right now? Right now? Right now? <laughs> the young men hardly knew what hit them. In a flash, they were incapacitated and hauled to the basement. Take it easy. Get your hand up there. Shut up! Get your ah. hand up there! Okay. Help! Oh, shut up! Hey! The guard, lured from his post, had had no time to press the panic button. No alarm had been tripped. The intruders must have known about the surveillance system because they quickly put it out of commission. They turned the cameras to face the wall and dismantled the printer that recorded activity from the sensors in every room. It was well planned. They knew how many guards were on duty. They knew where the um, videotape machine was and to take the tape. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum was now under their complete control. It was just after two. The dangerous part was over. No one knew the intruders were in the museum and the morning guard wasn't due until seven. 
that gave them hours to perform their illicit task. As bold as the thieves were, they didn't make the most of their opportunity. They had the whole museum to themselves in the dark of night. They could have pulled a truck up and removed a billion dollars worth of art, and instead they took a few valuable things and left behind an extraordinarily valuable assortment of, of paintings that, you know, fortunately are still there. Despite their expertise at breaking in, they seemed somewhat at a loss for which pieces to take or how to take them. Rembrandt's only seascape, Storm on the Sea of Galilee, was sliced out of its frame with a dull knife. The same fate awaited Rembrandt's Lady and Gentleman in Black. They also took a painting by Vermeer. In their assault of the gardener, they helped themselves to a small self-portrait of Rembrandt and some less valuable works, including a 3,000-year-old Chinese vessel and the finial from a Napoleonic battle flag. There seemed no rhyme or reason behind the choices they made. The sensors in each room indicated they'd spent two hours moving about the museum. Given that amount of time, the devastation of the paintings was all the more senseless. Although it's considered by many people the art crime of the century, and in terms of value and in terms of sort of impact it is, if you look at the details of it, it was also a botched crime. It was a crime in which a lot of good works of art that were there for the taking were missed, and artwork that was taken was cut from its frames, which is obviously not something you want to do with irreplaceable Rembrandts. The thieves' behavior suggested they weren't acting alone. What I suspect from that is that the robbers were recruited as robbers. My guess is they'd never done an art theft before. I very much suspect that there were other people behind the theft besides the, the two bogus police officers. When it was over, the thieves made off with 13 objects, estimated worth 200 to 300 million dollars. Sunday morning, 7 a.m., March 18th, 1990. The daytime guard at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum was puzzled when the night guards didn't come to the door. He waited until the maintenance man arrived. Neither had a key. They knew something wasn't right. Where were the guards? The museum's head of security arrived to let them in. His quick inspection of the rooms revealed no guards, missing artwork, and big trouble. He rushed to call the police. After their rescue, the guards gave their accounts of the night before. But it all happened too fast. Their descriptions of the thieves were hopelessly sketchy. Police sought better clues elsewhere in the museum. The thieves had been sloppy in removing the art. Detectives hoped they had been careless enough to leave a fingerprint or more. But no traces of their identities remained. Investigators would have to widen the search. After an art theft takes place, there are several things you do, and two important things which come to mind are, uh, number one, to look to your network of underworld informants, and number two, to, to try to catch up with the uh, stolen objects and use them to work your way back toward the thieves. Though the Gardner Museum and all its treasures are private property, art theft is a federal crime the FBI's domain. Agents wasted no time comparing this theft to similar ones and gathering a list of suspects. They trusted that their network of informants would bring some other names to light. A heist this big couldn't stay secret. The small museum offered a $1 million reward for any information leading to the return of the artwork an unprecedented sum four times higher than any reward ever offered. But then this was the biggest art theft of all time. 
If stolen artwork isn't recovered within a few days, it can vanish for decades or forever as it's sold to unwitting buyers and ends up in private collections. Agents needed to cover a lot of ground very quickly. They visited galleries and auction houses to see what they could find in terms of tangible goods or idle gossip. Despite all their efforts, they found nothing. That wasn't entirely surprising. Some paintings are simply too conspicuous to sell. I think we have to ask ourselves why at the high end they would bother with the Vermeer painting, which uh, most people would call unfensible. No criminal would uh, touch it because there's only 30-some-odd uh, Vermeers in the world and therefore they're very noticeable. It's like everybody knows where each one of them is supposed to be. Sometimes famous works are stolen simply in order to ransom them back to the museum for the insurance or reward money. If that was the robber's game, they had wasted their efforts. Though the $1 million reward was only a fraction of the art's value, the museum was unable to increase it. Then it shocked everyone when it revealed that the artwork wasn't even insured. And I begin with a bid of $500,000. Throughout the 80s, art prices skyrocketed. So did insurance premiums. The gardener simply couldn't afford the coverage its collection deserved. Without insurance, the museum could offer no more incentive for the return of the art. The reward money did appeal to tipsters. One informant mentioned the name of a man with mob connections and his partner. But when agents tracked them down, they learned that one had been found in the trunk of a Cadillac, tied up, stabbed multiple times, and with a plastic bag over his head. The other had died of heart disease. Authorities were literally at a dead end. The clock was running. Authorities believed the art would keep changing hands between shady sellers and naive buyers, erasing the trail of the real thieves. As the months crept by, Authorities feared that the Gardner Hall was destined to be part of the 75% of stolen art that is never recovered. Then, seven years after the crime in 1997, the FBI convinced the museum's supporters to pool their resources, enabling the desperate Gardner Museum to increase the reward from $1 million to $5 million. The statute of limitations on the crime had expired two years earlier. The time was ripe for something to happen. While researching an unrelated story, Boston Herald reporter Tom Mashberg got a tip that a man named Miles Connor was involved with the Gardner caper. Now, if you're from Massachusetts or you're familiar with any of the sort of recent crime lore of the Boston area, the one name that rings a lot of bells is Miles Connor. Miles is a sort of famous for being a very successful art thief. Well, I guess not that successful because he spent a lot of time in jail. In fact, Connor was in prison when the Gardner heist occurred. Mashberg learned that he had a friend, William Youngworth. Youngworth was an antiques dealer with 11 aliases and a 10-page felony record. He was under investigation by the FBI for firearms and drug charges. Youngworth also had in his possession a museum piece that authorities knew Connor had stolen years earlier. Mashberg started writing about Youngworth's connection to Connor and possibly to the Gardner crime. Youngworth wasn't happy about it. Well, after two or three articles appeared in which we really put some pressure on him and caused him a lot of sort of discomfort by putting his name out in the public arena, he called me up directly at the paper and yelled at me and told me to stop writing all these lies about him. But as they talked, Youngworth must have realized that the press, and especially Mashberg, could be his greatest ally. On August 18th, 1997, Mashberg received an anonymous call asking him to meet a stranger in the middle of the night. Mashberg knew this had something to do with Youngworth and the art. So I met that person, and we took a long, circuitous drive through a dark warehouse district somewhere 
within an hour's drive of Boston. Youngworth had said he could broker the return of the artwork in exchange for the reward money and immunity from prosecution. Mashberg told him that authorities needed proof that he really had access to the paintings. This was Youngworth's way of providing the proof. He arranged for Mashberg to see Rembrandt's storm on the Sea of Galilee. And the person shone the flashlight right on the signature as if to sort of say, ta-da, see, here it is the signature Rembrandt that proves that we have the art. That's it. I didn't really get to see it. And I only got to look at it for about 30 seconds. The show's over. Okay. The Show painting over. was quickly returned to its tube. Mashberg was escorted out of the warehouse and into a waiting cab. He agreed to sit on the story for 10 days until the paintings could be moved elsewhere. Mashberg is convinced he saw the real thing. But the reason why I don't believe it was a fraudulent painting is very simple. There's no way on earth that the gardener would give $5 million for a fraudulent painting. The only way they would give the $5 million is if the painting could be authenticated. And if the painting was a fraud, what was the point of showing it to me? other than to fool me. There was no point in that. Mashberg broke the story 10 days later. He wrote that Youngworth could broker the return of the art in exchange for the $5 million reward, his own immunity, and Connor's early release from prison. Deals like that were becoming Miles Connor's trademark. It wouldn't be the first time Connor used stolen art to buy his freedom. In 1975, he brokered the return of a Rembrandt stolen from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts years earlier. It occurred to him that he might be able to leverage himself out of this problem with the law and get himself less jail time if he could be responsible for helping return a piece of stolen art. Well, of course, he stole the art first and then returned it, which is not exactly what I suppose the authorities have in mind. And in exchange for the return of the painting, he was given a far shorter sentence. That audacious plan had worked in 1975, and it looked like Connor and Youngworth were about to try it again, using the stolen gardener art. Connor still had three years of a 10-year sentence, and Youngworth was facing prison time of his own. Connor told Mashberg that he and two accomplices had cased the gardener years earlier and had seen how lax the security was. In fact, Connor boasted that one of his men had unlocked a window. He returned every few months to find it remained unlocked. According to Connor, while he and Youngworth sat in prison, their two partners may have continued planning the Gardner Museum heist without them and then pulled it off but they lacked Connor's eye and his respect for the artwork. It seems like the people who went in were people who were following the kind of plan that Connor would have organized, but without him there, they sort of freelanced as they went along. So they broke glass here to get at paintings, they cut other paintings out, and they ended up not taking all the best or most valuable items. Connor had told authorities that he knew who stole the gardener's art. They were the same men he cased the museum with years earlier. One of them, William Houghton, was also the custodian of Connor's extensive art collection whenever Connor was doing time. It wasn't the first time agents heard Houghton's name. He was one of the dead-end leads the FBI had followed earlier in the investigation. Perhaps it wasn't such a dead end after all. After Houghton's death, Youngworth became the next in line to hold Miles Connor's artwork. He had it moved from Houghton's storage unit. Connor alleged that Youngworth unintentionally picked up some of Houghton's plunder at the same time. The gardener art was among it. 
That would explain how it fell innocently into Youngworth's hands. In their minds, that entitled them to the reward, since they were willing to help recover it. To the FBI, Connor and Youngworth's plan sounded like extortion. One flashlit peek by a newspaper reporter was hardly enough to motivate stroking a $5 million check and springing two felons. Come on, I didn't, I didn't really get to see it. There would be no immunity granted until Connor and Youngworth could prove they had the real thing and prove they weren't directly responsible for stealing it. The case of the missing Gardner masterpieces was at a stalemate. Connor refused to provide any more information and Youngworth wouldn't talk unless he and Connor were granted immunity. The FBI refused unless the two could prove they could get the art. In October 1997, that proof arrived in Tom Mashbird's office. A small quantity of paint chips and some photographs of the stolen Rembrandts. The negatives were scrutinized. The Herald's photo lab determined that they weren't doctored. The FBI agreed, but said they were photos of reproductions, not the real paintings. The paint chips were sent to a forgery expert for verification. So he looked at the paint chips and he said that there was no way on earth they could be anything but from the era of Rembrandt, which is to say that they were paint chips from the 1600s from a specific region in the Netherlands where Rembrandt, Vermeer, and some of the other Dutch masters got their paint and, and painted their works. So that was a very good indication that the paint chips were authentic. Connor and Youngworth hoped this would be proof enough. It wasn't. When the FBI tested the chips, they determined that they didn't match the ones left at the scene of the crime. Agents had no way to test them against the missing Vermeer, which they may actually have been from. The case was back to square one. Everybody had a different agenda. The criminal's agenda was to get the $5 million reward. My agenda as a journalist was to get a good story. Okay. The Gardner's agenda, of course, was to get its art back. But the feds and their agenda was to make an arrest to solve the crime. They required more and more proof, eventually asking Connor and Youngworth to present one of the stolen pieces. Well, when we talked to the lawyers, the lawyers said that that would be foolhardy because the minute Youngworth or somebody associated with him produced an item, they would swoop in, they would arrest him, they would indict him for extortion, and the story would fall apart. Connor and Youngworth didn't take the bait, and the negotiations, so promising a few weeks earlier, now began to break down. Connor insisted that the window of opportunity was closing. The time to act was now. But the FBI held its ground, demanding more proof. The two sides were at loggerheads. Communication stopped. In the end, everyone lost. Connor served his full sentence. And Youngworth went back to prison on unrelated charges. Neither would see a penny of the $5 million reward. In the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, empty frames hang on the wall garnering as much notice, perhaps, as the artwork they once contained. The only winner, it seems, is Tom Mashberg, who got his good story after all, even if it's a tragedy. I think that the offer was genuine and had everybody just followed through by granting the criminals immunity and by guaranteeing the transfer of the reward money, I think those paintings would have been returned. The possibility remains that Youngworth and Connor never really had the paintings at all. Officially, the crime is still unsolved. Removed from the rarefied atmosphere of a museum, it's likely that the paintings may no longer exist or are damaged beyond all repair. The gardener's stolen treasures may be lost to the entire world.